I'll apologize a little bit in advance. Uh, we've been publishing in the bulletin the story of, of Marvel, the marvelous mystery. So some of what you're going to see, you probably have already seen at some level in the bulletin. And this is sort of the rest of the story. There's a little bit backstory here. Um, um, we also have a few surprise guests with us today, which we'll be introducing at the right time. I think you might find interesting. And uh, without further ado, let's, let's cut in. I'm gonna start with something that my wife warned, oh God, um, you're broadcasting your big ego at the beginning of the show, this is stupid. But there's a reason, so let's, let's start. It's the ramble. Many of you may know me from the two books, okay? That's just my ego thing, right? <laughs> but there's a reason, there's an ego, and by the way, they are still available for sale, and all the profits go to the Capital Association. We've donated all profits to the Capital Association. So, um, so yeah. But the reason I bring that up is because if you've read the books, you know that it's about our family's love affair with this old boat, the Buckrammer, 1908, Charles Crosby. And um, if you haven't had the pleasure of, of sailing aboard an old boat, especially a Crosby boat or a Hanley boat, it's just an amazing experience. And we're gonna try to find some of you in one of these boats, but uh, it, is, it is really incredible. As my wife says, it's creaky and leaky, <laughs> but it is, ama it is amazing. It's amazing the smell of pine tar, the wood, uh, and to think that these things were built like, before the 1920s or earlier, you know, it's, it's, um, they're an incredible experience. Uh, here's the boat the last year we owned her. We, we, uh, we sold the boat, um, I guess now about seven years ago. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, we use the boat like many of you do as sort of a summer house. And uh, the kids loved it and we used it every weekend and during the summer when they were off of school and I took week time off, but they grew up, <laughs> unfortunately. And, uh, and my oldest daughter and her family moved to France. My son and his family moved to Spain for their jobs. My youngest daughter moved to Washington, D.C. And so uh, that left myself and one of my sailing buddies, who's usually here, Gene Kennedy, uh, to, oh, he's over there, there he is, to, uh, to sail the boat or single-hand the boat. And uh, the last year we, well, we had Buck Rammer, um, I sailed her all of six times for an average, a total time of about 24 hours. And uh, it was just maybe time. Uh, my wife um, did the math. <laughs> She said, let me see, I think you spent 7,500, or we spent 75, I wrote checks for 7,500 for 24 hours, which is about $312.50 an hour. <laughs> and when I would get back from a couple of hours of sailing with, uh, with Jean, uh, she would have a comment, something like this. <laughs> And she's a saint, believe me. She's a saint for putting up with us all, the, but, but I, I, okay, I got it. So we, we sold the boat to a very capable merchant marine uh, captain who took her to Gloucester and enjoyed her for many years. And then while he was uh, bringing the boat down to, uh, New, uh, to Connecticut, uh, she got caught by a rogue wave, um, uh, broke her spine, uh, dismasted, and was rescued by the Coast Guard. And uh, I, a long story, another whole story, but she's currently in New Jersey awaiting restoration. So we're hoping that she has another one of her many li nine lives. So I moved on to a boat that we've had in our family for many years, a Beetle Cat, and sailed her. I, you had to have a cat boat under you. And, uh, and so this was our Beetle, which we had rebuilt twice. And, and again, about a year ago, uh, it was getting to the point where she needed a third rebuild. I just didn't have it in me. And so we donated her to the International Yacht Restoration School. And I think many of you know that they will take um, amazingly <laughs> dilapidated beetles and bring them back, back to life. So uh, that's where the driftwood is currently. Which brings us to November. Now I began to broadcast to the cast of characters that I play with that I was looking for another cat boat. I needed a cat boat under me. And ideally, it would be a cat boat, a fiberglass cat boat, <laughs> radical, like a little Marshall or an Aries Pond or a Menger, 
probably used so I could afford it. And, um, and the, the advantage of, of a fiberglass boat, as you know, is that as Jeff Marshall and Tony Davis say, it only requires one tool for annual maintenance, a garden hose. <laughs> you know, you hose it off in the spring and off you go, right? This is it. So this is why I was looking for something that maybe didn't require the journey of a thousand steps to get her into the, into the water. Which brings me to this character. <laughs> who is, I guess, not here. I guess he's left. He knew this was coming. And um, at first, Eric Peterson said, uh, hey, Conway, I've got a boat for you. It's a wooden boat I bought for a dollar somewhere. And <laughs> you know, okay, and it called the Bimbo. You're going to love it. And I looked at it. It was a wooden boat. needed a lot of work. It, it has now become the Margaret. Uh, Bob converted her into the spectacular boat, the Margaret. Uh, but Bob said, I have just the boat for you, just the boat. All she needs is a little paint and putty. <laughs> and I said, really? She said, yeah, well, it's a wooden boat, but you know, it's, it, you could get this, into, you, this, this boat is ready to go in the water. It needs a new centerboard, but it could go in the water pretty quickly. And even somebody with my limited skills could, uh, could accomplish this. <laughs> so, so I said, all right, well, send me a picture. And we'll take a look. And he said, well, I, I, I'll take a picture, but maybe I should just deliver the boat to you, you know? <laughs> I said, well, you know, maybe, send, send, can I visit the boat? Well, you know, uh, I'll send you a picture. So I finally got the picture. And there she is. <laughs> I think that, I think that, 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 that port side needed a little paint, maybe. No, actually, this is not, this is not the boat. I'm sorry, I, a, little, a little joke. This is, this is the boat. And, uh, and I must say, I looked, when we looked at this, uh, we kind of fell in love. I said, oh my goodness, this is a, this is a very special boat. Her, her shear was beautiful. It doesn't look like the Buckrammer. Buckrammer was built as a fishing boat. This boat was built as a racing boat. Uh, had an underslung rudder. And, um, and certainly needed some work, but I wasn't sure how much, but it was something that might, might be doable. And on top of that, the, the killer was, Bob said, she might be this historic D-class racing boat, the Marvel. And I went, oh my goodness. <laughs> I said, oh. This is one of many pictures of Marvel uh, taken in 1904 through 1907. And uh, I, I didn't know what a D-class boat meant, but I thought, oh, this, this looks pretty special. So this presented me with a dilemma. The dilemma was, should I invest in rescuing a historic cap boat again? You know, this is it. But would this <laughs> result in a divorce, which is a distinct, pos a distinct possibility, right? And I thought, but it could be Buck Rammer 2.0, you know, Buck Rammer 2.0. Um, but then again, uh, that Seren 50, if it's all in shape and so forth and so on. And so I thought I could plead insanity and you know, maybe get on. But so I got to talking with Bob and uh, Bob Luckcraft and, and I, you know, this, we have to do something. This is a shame to have this boat just melting away. And the light bulb went on, maybe an evil non-LED light bulb. And, uh, and we thought maybe we could crowdsource the thing. We could crowdsource the restoration of the boat and even maybe have a mission of the boat that could be, uh, could be special. Could we maybe get people that were patrons could actually you know, enjoy sailing in the boat without having to own the boat. You know, the, uh, uh, and I know many of you have probably seen, this, there are probably dozens and dozens of crowdsource things on YouTube at the moment. Tally Ho, Acorn, Starabella, Yaba and so forth. I mean, some of these are, are amazing stories about boats being restored or boats being built. And, um, and I talked with most of the folks that are doing this and they said, go for it, go for it. You'd be surprised, you'd be surprised. And again, our goal was to have folks enjoy the boat without necessarily having to own the boat. So I went back to Bob <laughs> and said, all right, um, I think we, let's let's do this. Let's do this. He says, "All right." So now I have to get permission from the owners. I said, "Oh, owners, uh, 
which we call the Susan Group, because the boat was called Susan at the time. And these are the owners. And I know some of them are here today. I know the, uh, the Auschwitzes are here. So, so the, uh, um, anyway, the, um, uh, that was the owner group. And I thought, oh, this is going to be difficult. So, so, uh, so Bob went to the owner group and said, um, hey, I think I have a live one. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what, would you, what would you sell the boat for? And they, in unanimity, they said, a dollar. <laughs> and even better, they said, hey, if you're going to do a crowdsource thing, we'll tell you what, we'll donate $500 to the initiation of the crowdsource fund. Uh, so I went back to my spouse and I, I said all this, and she said, you're not spending any money on this, right? I said, no, just my time. And they said, oh, all right, let's do it. And so. With that, we created a crowdsource site. Many of you here have contributed generously to this site, so thank you very much. And um, we also applied for nonprofit status so that folks that did make a donation could enjoy tax benefits if they were so willing to take them. Uh, donations accumulated um, um, with remarkable rapidity. Within a few months, we had uh, almost $9,000 in the fund, uh, which, it's not a lot of money for a boat restoration, but it certainly helps. We also had donations from uh, folks uh, that would just write a check and then send it, drop it in the mail. And so within a short period of time, we had close to $15,000 raised uh, towards the restoration of the boat, which again, anyone who knows boat restoration, that doesn't go a long way, but it certainly would, it was a good start. We also had uh, donations in kind people that heard about this from all over the, the, the planet would say, hey, I have an extra anchor, could you use that? I have two, two gallons of anti-fouling paint that I'm not using, and so forth and so on. And so we began to accumulate a lot of things that could be useful. Uh, someone donated 1,000 feet of anchor line, brand new anchor line, and so forth. So it was, it was fascinating to see this at work. And we had lots of volunteers. People said, hey, if, if you need a person to paint the boat or redo the electrical work on the boat, um, it's just sign me up. And so at this point, all we really hoped to do was just call Brownell, move the boat from uh, the, the, the backyard that was stored in on the Cape, and bring it to Westport, uh, Mass, where, where the local boatyard there, Trips, had reserved a spot for us, and they wouldn't charge us. If people wanted to work on the boat that were not yard people, uh, we could, they would allow them to, us to do that. So that was a very useful thing which led to this, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> which brings us to January 2020. Does anybody, does that ring a bell with anybody? <laughs> what went wrong was this. <laughs> and I remember calling Brownell and getting a recording saying, uh, we're, we're no longer hauling and we have no idea when we'll be doing that again. And the whole, basically the whole world shut down. And so uh, here was this boat stranded on the Cape. We did buy, Bob or Art Leckraft and I bought a very nice cover for the boat. We finally covered her over, buttoned her up. We actually removed the old uh, broken centerboard, which was this cast iron thing. It was pretty amazing, all bent out of shape. And then we decided, what should we do going forward? And what we decided to do was to research the boat. And uh, because you can do this on a computer, you don't need to be wear a mask. And, uh, we enlisted uh, Stan Grayson, who you know, who's written many books on cat boats. Uh, Joe Chatwick, who, I don't know, was he here? I don't know if Joe is here. There he is, over in the corner there. And, um, and others uh, to do the, the research. Was this the marvel? So now I'm gonna quickly kind of go through this. Some of you have seen this. Uh, there were three things that suggested she might be the marvel. First was uh, registration papers with the state of Massachusetts that, uh, that well, by its then owner, Ira Whittemore, who said the boat was, was built by Herb Crosby in 1904. Uh, or maybe by Daniel, or maybe by Charles Crosby. <laughs> but we did see in early photographs, there was a builder's plate, H, H. F. Crosby. So we thought, all right, this is probably a Crosby boat. Um, we later also discovered that it wasn't actually built for Ira Whittemore. There were two previous owners, and so that we now believe, with still being researched, that she was built in 1890 or 1892. So she's an old timer. Uh, we also had the, a, a giant photograph that had been given to me, which we have on display in the, 
in the boathouse uh, next door here. And, uh, and it was a DCAT. And we had originally, the, we saw the builder's plate, but the builder's plate had been stolen uh, on the Cape by somebody who turns builder's plates into belt buckles. And um, so we, we knew it had the builder's plate at one time, but uh, the builder's plate was missing. But we did have photographs. OK, so very quickly, so what is a DCAT? What is a DCAT? Well, at the time, uh, this is 2020, Stan Grayson was writing this article, which would appear a year later in Wooden Boat Magazine. And uh, the DCATs were actually an, a made-up class of boat uh, that were repurposed, recycled versions of these boats from the golden age of, uh, of cap boating. The, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, C.C. Hanley wrote, uh, invented the Harbinger when he saw a race, said, I can build one of these things, and he, and he did, and that won all the races, and then everybody wanted a racing cap boat. And so uh, Marvel's uh, heritage is in this class of boats. But the rich folks that owned these boats only raced them from about 1880, 85, to about 1900, and then put them on the hard and forgot about them. So this group, this group in, uh, in Quincy resurrected the boats. And, uh, and the reason they've actually survived to this point is that uh, it has been a history of these boats being survived, surviving from that point. This is the only D-class boat that we know of that is currently under sail. This is the Grayling, uh, Doug Goldhurst's boat up in Maine. And you can see what a boat that's fully rigged um, in, 19, in uh, 2023 looks like. And uh, uh, I'm told that it's a bit of a bullet when it, when it goes. When we're dying to race one of these things against the Kathleen, which is also a bullet. But, but uh, it's, uh, they're tremendously over canvassed. So here's a, I'll quickly, I'll step through. So the research was, uh, we had lots of photographs of Marvel. Uh, the newspapers actually provide a very good uh, uh, illustration of, the, of, the, of the, the races and so forth. If you, if you type in cat boats into the newspapers.com site, you get 24,000 hits. But, but if you type Marvel into the Boston Globe at this time, you get 12 hits. And the, uh, the Globe used to report uh, on these boats because there were significant money purses involved in the races. And, uh, and every Sunday, there'd be an entire page in the Boston Sunday Globe that gave all the race results and the purses that were awarded and so forth. It was sort of like somebody following the horse races. Uh, so here's the owner in 1904 of the boat, Ira Whittemore. It's the only known picture that, we, that Stan Grayson's been able to find of Ira. Here's an example of a, ch of a chunk from the Boston Globe that shows the boats that raced. Every one of these boats was a D-class boat that was a repurposed Golden Age boat. You can see there are many in the fleet. And even Rudder Magazine, which was the magazine of boating at the time, followed, uh, followed these boats. And, uh, and here's, here's a, a clip from one of the boats. It shows actually how many races the Marvel won um, that particular season. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that, again, we're trying to find out, is this the Marvel? And the, the documentation keeps calling it a Crosby boat, but, but almost never identifies it as a Herb Crosby or a Daniel Crosby or a Charles Crosby, just a Crosby boat, which is frustrating. You can see here, uh, it's just mentioned as a Crosby boat from Osterville. Now, in 1907, it turns out Stan stumbled on an ad that was in the Rudder magazine that the boat, after having an incredible 1904, 1905, 1906 winning season, uh, was suddenly put up for sale. And you can see from this little clip here, I think it's mentioned that um, it gives you the dimensions and so forth, although the dimensions vary from, from uh, documentation to documentation. They're not completely accurate. But we, but we learned that uh, in these races, uh, uh, Whittemore won at least every year a minimum of $350, which is the equivalent at that time of half a man's salary, half the average man's salary, are about thirty dollars to $35,000. So these, these boats competed significantly and seriously at the time. So the question is, why did Whittemore sell this incredible winning boat? He sold this incredible winning boat because he bought the Elmira. 
which at the time was the fastest of the fastest. Here it is, she, she is beating the Harbinger. In fact, she was built to beat the Harbinger by C.C. Hanley, who, who, who built both of these boats. And, and, and it turns out that Whittemore seemed to change boats about as often as I change socks, about every two to three years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we lost track, and then again, good old Stan discovered a little clip in the Boston Globe that the Marvel um, was famous enough to have this publication that said she was being shipped to New York, uh, purchased by um, this, uh, this gentleman that's, um, uh, that's listed here, and uh, Hugh Ray. Uh, she was going to North Beach, Long Island, and she was gonna ship the day after April 18th. And we did, we did research to see what, what ships, what, uh, what steamers left from Boston to New York on April 19th, and we found it was the SS Wilton. So at some point, this is a, a standard photograph of the Wilton, doesn't show the boat on it, but the, the boat made her way from Boston to, um, to New York on the Wilton. And at that time, and I think Henry Coley and I were talking about this, uh, there was a, a move afoot to, uh, by the New York people to begin racing these boats in the New York circuit. They had mostly been raced uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Boston market. And now some movement into the New York and even as far as, as south as Barnegat Bay. So we think that that was the idea. It turns out that this guy, Mr. Ray, was the real estate broker for the Steinway Piano Company. And, um, and he would keep the boat adjacent to the factory at North Beach, which was the Coney Island before Coney Island. And, uh, and at this uh, little marina, which also had very early uh, water planes, seaplanes, and we now know it as LaGuardia. So where it says marina, that's where, that's where the marvel ended up, and right across from Rikers Island, which is kind of interesting, at, at North Beach. And she was there, as far as we can determine, from 1907 until 1921, sailing in the racing circuit in New York. And then in 1921, she was bought by William Shard, who's a boat builder uh, on Brush Island, in Brush Island, Connecticut, and that's in Darien, Connecticut. And, uh, and this is where we lose track of the boat. We've been trying very hard to find out where did she go from here, and, uh, and we have un been unable to do that. We're working on it. Which brings us to, you know, what happened to her? Well. We thought, let's try a different approach to see if we can find the pedigree. And that was the top down. So we know we bought the boat from the Susan Group, and we went and said, all right, who did you buy the boat from? And they mentioned these two names. And they thought they were New York people. And I thought, well, you know, searching Kaplan would be hard maybe, but uh, Megadesian, that's an interesting name. There are probably not too many of those around. So we went on to LinkedIn and found there were actually hundreds of Mercadesians. <laughs> Maybe hundreds. This is just the Boston market. In New York, there were like 1,400. Wow, popular name. But and believe it or not, we began calling. We began sending emails. And after the 29th email, we discovered that it was Jeff and Hoda who actually owned the boat. This is Jeff. And, and Jeff apologizes. He was due to be here speaking. And he's undergoing treatment for cancer. And he's had a very bad. Uh, experience with his chemotherapy this week, so he unfortunately called me on Monday and said, please extend my apology to the gang. This is, uh, I just won't be able to make it. So I'm gonna w basically try to recreate his speech. So this is, uh, this is Jeff. He characterized himself as being the painter and the crew to uh, Hoda, who we said was really the person that knew how to sail boats, uh, was, was in love with cat boats and convinced him uh, to, uh, to go in partnership with her to buy a cat boat. They, they both met while restoring this boat, the Waver Tree, which is in South Street Seaport. Maybe some of you have seen it. They, are, they, are, they were capable people. They know how to restore boats. And, uh, and so they thought, let's try restoring a little bit smaller boat than the Waver Tree. So um, they began looking. This is one cat boat that they almost purchased. Um, and then they decided not to when the director of the Waver Tree program said, there's a guy in, in Connecticut who has a really sweet cat boat. That's the boat you should buy. 
And so they were introduced to Sunnyside. Uh, this is the boat. Uh, here is his Hoder and Jeff inspecting it. They thought it was in pretty decent shape. And they bought it. And they had the boat uh, from, uh, I think it was, uh, what, 19, uh, uh, 1990, I guess, to 2008. And uh, they sailed the boat roughly from Mystic Seaport down to Tom's River. That was their cruising ground. And then all around Long Island, Long Island Sound. And they had restored the boat. They, they, they did a very nice job bringing the boat back to life. Here they are sailing. They ran the boat out of Oyster Bay on Long Island. After, towards the end of the time they owned it, the boat was getting a bit tired. They brought her over to Noway, Connecticut to a professional boatyard. They said it was beyond their ability to really restore it properly. And so the restoration began in the Noway boatyard. And unfortunately, uh, about halfway into the restoration, uh, Hoda was killed in an automobile accident. And, um, and, and Jeff, he said, I lost my, my boating soulmate. He kept the boat and sailed in the boat single-handed for a few years, but ultimately said I, my heart wasn't in it, and he sold the boat. And this is actually a clip from uh, one of the bulletins where they put the boat up for sale. And he said, uh, I think he was asking, I guess, $5,000 of best offer. And I don't know what, what the Susan Group ended up paying. Maybe Bob knows. Less than that, probably. <laughs> yeah. I think about that amount. And, um, I think she was re in reasonably good shape, but uh, but um, so that's that was the pass off. Now he now Jeff is still working when he can at the South Street Seaport. Here he is in the restoration of the tugboat W O Decker, and again he expresses his regrets not being able to be here. He's also been a p significant contributor financially to the restoration of the of the marvel. Okay, so now we knew that um, we knew Jeff, and. Um, we said, who did, you, who did you buy the boat from? You know? And he said, we bought it from Walter. Uh, Walter, uh, also known as Bucky and uh, Kresnowitz. And uh, so we started another search. And uh, through LinkedIn, uh, a long story, we finally um, encountered the oldest daughter of, um, of Bucky, uh, Catherine Green, lives in California. And she got very excited about the possibility that we might be investigating this boat, maybe even restoring this boat. And she said, I'll, let me, I'll help any way that I can. And I'm gonna stop uh, right now because again, we were hoping to have a live video feed uh, from California at this point, uh, but uh, Catherine's had a, a, a kind of a bad year. She, her son passed away unexpectedly and uh, mudslides have kind of wrecked a lot of her life <laughs> right at the moment out in California. But we are lucky to have with us today uh, Catherine's uh, sister, um, uh, Beth Buckley, and her brother, Tom Krasnowitz. Why don't you guys come up? Please put your hands together. Both Beth and Tom uh, live in Connecticut. Took them about an hour and a half to get here. Not too, not too bad. Okay. Catherine Halloran and Walter Krasnowitz, both born and raised in Stamford, Connecticut, fell in love and married in 1948. Catherine was born in 49, and over the next 10 years, two girls and two boys were added to their family. Uh, here they all are in our family car, their second Studebaker. Now Bucky, he dreamed of a sailboat. And Kay dreamed of having another child. Yeah. <laughs> so an agreement was struck. <laughs> Bucky got his cat boat. And this is this is this is she. Um, and if you can read, you can read what it says. Uh, this cat boat is missing its motor, its propeller, and its shaft, and its keel. <laughs> and he paid, he paid $300 for this in 1961. Uh, and one thing I want you to take a look at, that little arrow there that just came up, the bill of sale is signed by both Helen Chase and, uh, and Alfred Chase. 
And we're going to come back to Hel Helen in a little bit. You'll see, what, but that fits into the story. But um, who in this room would pay $300 for a boat without a motor, <laughs> a prop, <laughs> a key, or a, key, or a keel? Now, Kate got the baby boy. And here's the baby boy. This is Patrick. And if you look at the bill of sale for Patrick, <laughs> you see, he only cost $239. So the question is, who got the better deal? <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Beth. Go ahead, Beth. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Catherine remembers the day the vote arrived at their home. It was raining and she was walking to junior high when a flatbed truck passed her on the highway taking up two lanes. She wasn't there for the landing, but it must have been a challenge since their house was on a hill and it had to be backed in besides the garage. When she got home and saw it, and saw it she thought, what was her father doing with a bottomless boat? And, and it truly was a, a, bottomless, a bottomless boat. The, uh, now this is I'll, I'll I'll jump in here because the, the uh, it's interesting uh, they were, they, as you'll see later they the the family and Walter and Bucky had a, a very strong relationship with an artist who did the Cats and Jammer Kids, uh, named Peter Wells, and a lot of the uh, the history of this boat is illustrated uh, by Peter Wells, and so this is an illustration that Wells created in partnership with Bucky, that um, explains the. Um, the, the, the rebuilding, they called it the, the resurrection phase of the boat, which lasted from roughly 1962 to 1968. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. Uh, the cat boat was in the yard until the late 1960s. The name Sunnyside was chosen as a nod to our mother's fondness for Washington Irving's Hudson Valley home, Sunnyside, and Bucky's business location on Sunnyside Avenue in Stanford. And one of these people that think it's, it's, Beth, you're in the back of that sled, yes. right? Yes, yeah. indeed. Yep. Peter ah, Peter Wells was a member, I just heard, okay. Uh, here's Tom, my brother Tom, painting the bottom of Sunnyside at uh, Marina America. Tom can tell you how his dad repaired the leaks with a coffee can of sawdust and what Bucky used to, in place of his centerboard when he was first launched. Do you want to make any comment about this, Tom? Or you're being accused of, of oh, stopping yeah, leaks yeah. with with, uh, with sawdust. Actually, the transom was uh, leaking a little bit when they set it in his, and they held it in his slings, and they put the uh, sawdust in the tin can, flipped it around, and would go into the crack and seal it up. And it was I was kind of amazed at that. But it was a simple trick, and it worked. So it worked. people kept going. I think I think there are probably several in this room who have had have used the same trick. I know that Bob has. Bob Elker has. Yeah. Uh, and off, Bucky sails out of Stanford Harbor into the Sound. And here he is uh, with a big smile on his face, I think, here and uh, enjoying, the, enjoying the boat. They, uh, one of the things that I, I, I'll mention, you'll see this later on when we very quickly go through the restoration that, uh, that, that we conducted, is that, and I think, Tom, you were making the comment, that um, uh, Bucky owned a, um, a salvage business and, uh, and so collected all manner of things from like the Luda's boat yard and others and, and put them together to, in, into the boat. Some people have, for example, criticized the fact or noted that the port lights on, on Sunnyside don't match the, the picture of the port lights on the marble. And that's because the, the entire cabin was replaced at some time. And as far as we know, we believe, and you'll see later, that Bucky probably use salvage port lights to replace the ones that were in the boat originally. So the boat has gone through a number of trans, uh, trans, uh, you know, transitions and over the course of time. Oh, where are we here? Having a lot of kids helps when you need a crew. In the 70s, uh, myself, Tom, Tim, Patrick, and Marianne were favorites. I had a question about that. You said they, you, Catherine says that you guys were favorites. What did that mean? What happened? <laughs> that, that you were favorites. Uh, that that you were that you were favorites. Does that mean she was not a favorite? You have to. You'll have to ask her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'm just reading it. Okay. Uh, ship's logs of 1977 to 1980 tell the story of where Sunnyside went and when, what the occasion was, and who was aboard. 
The Hudson River, Oyster River, Mystic, Narragansett, Rhode Island, Falmouth, Austerville, Martha's Vineyard, Barnstable, Plymouth, Chelsea, Sandwich, Mattaponset, Mil Milford, and more. Wow. Yeah, this was a, she, she was a well-traveled boat, and in fact, even made her way to Boston this, for one of the Tall Ships uh, events. And yeah. you can see- so, Sunnyside was in Boston Harbor on May 30th, 1980, for Boston's 350th anniversary. She participated in the Tall Ships Parade uh, with cat boats with friendship sloops. Sunnyside's big S on her sail still lets you know she was there. It's a, it's sort of a rare aerial view before drones of, uh, of, of, uh, of the sailboats for the Tall Ships race. She was pulled out of the water in the early 80s and parked at 55 Sunnyside Avenue in Stamford for the restoration. So here's it, and it was quite an extensive restoration. We have lots of photographs, which is just a few, but this, the boat was essentially mostly taken apart again and then, and then reassembled. It was in, in a first class job. Here's another Peter Wells. I, I mistakenly called this the resurrection. This is actually the restoration phase. Yeah, this but. was uh, at the Mystic uh, Wooden Boat Show. And uh, Peter Wells put this thing together for him. You know, they took the pictures. And that was like on a stand, you know, and they had it in front there. Which was a lot of fun at Mystic. Yeah. With the boat parade and all that. Am I reading this? You can just read that. Okay. Yeah. Over the years, many people worked on Sunnyside. That, of course, included Bucky and his children, as well as employees at his business, Vulcan Surplus. Plus, he was fortunate to have known many talented craftspeople that included those from Looters Marine Construction in Stamford, Connecticut, some of whom had worked on the construction of the America's Cup boat Weatherly at Looters. And I'll just comment that, as you'll see, uh, that uh, we actually took a page uh, from this approach and had lots and lots of volunteers, a whole volunteer army, basically, Navy, what maybe, uh, work on the restoration of which Bob Luckcraft here was one of the principals. Sitting pretty and ready to go. This time we paint with the tides. Tom under the boat and Uncle Pitch standing by. When a restored sunny side was launched, our dad had a new level of fun with his boat. Boat parades, cat boat, and antique boat get-togethers, and more sails with family and friends. He was happy and happiest when aboard. The Broad Axe Award for recognition of the restoration of an old cat boat was, of course, a high point in his life. The award stated, and I quote, the recipient of this year's Broad Axe Award decided to buy a bottomless 1905 Herbert Crosby cat and had her delivered to his backyard in 1962 on a flatbed truck. This period was known as the resurrection. Work started immediately reframing, replanking, and redecking with the help of his family and friends. She was relaunched in 1969. This man, whose middle name is Work, was not satisfied, so now came the period known as restoration. Everything needed replacement or repairs was done, including new, new mass, boom, gap, stainless fittings, transom, combings, etc. The, the uh, boat was relaunched in 1984. And I'll have to, and I'll have to mention that we, we had no idea, as we were doing the research on this boat, that uh, that Walter Buggy was a member of the Capital Association, or that he had received the Broad Axe Award uh, for the second restoration. This was this came out of the blue. Uh, uh, we, I was talking with Catherine Green uh, during one of our sessions, and she said, um, "Oh yeah, by the way, you know, what, what is the Broad Axe Award? This is uh, I think the dad got this." So I, mean, I went, "Oh my goodness!" So the that was that was a huge surprise, and you can see the Broad Axe is out on display in the lobby here. Having a sail on Sunnyside was a favorite with Dad's uh, friends. Among them, cartoonist Peter Wells, a cat bone owner as well, often would give him a cartoon after each sail. And yes, Sunnyside's galley was never used. A cat boat birthday cake here. Sunnyside shared Bucky's birthday that year. My sister Marianne made that. And, and I'll have to, you have, you have to look at the, uh, the Wells cartoon to say today's menu is peanuts with Perrier. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and the note to Bucky, um, 
All, um, all stomach needed, the, my stomach needed the vacation, Peter Wells. The, uh, and you can see that the stove in, in the boat uh, grew flowers, basically. Well, Peter Wells was another Capo guy. Yes, we, we just learned that he was a member of the Capo yeah, Association. Yeah. But he was always wanted to have eggs ah. on, the, on his boat. But my dad never did that, you know, he, so he was a little upset over that. Ah, interesting. <laughs> What can I say? There's nothing like sailing the boat you rescued and restored. Yeah, and this is a, this is a, a great shot of Bucky at the helm and a little bit of water here going and uh, with a little bit of heel and it uh, looks like he's enjoying himself. John, I think um, uh, Peter Wells owned Valiant, Charles Crosby. Okay, oh, Crosby Valiant. Okay, we just John heard that. Crosby. Charles Crosby. As we, both, we don't know Charles Crosby. So here's, the, um, here's the, another Peter Wells, that's probably the saddest of the Peter Wells illustrations, which is documenting the sale of Sunnyside in, uh, in 1990. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, is there, is there part of the script in that? Or no, not? just no. the top there. Just, just here. And um, I, I can, we can all imagine that uh, after owning this boat for so many years, that this must have been a, a bit of, tra of a trauma. Mm. Yeah, it was both, you know, sad but happy to see it go. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of maintenance to that boat, but uh, you learned a lot of things on it through the years when I was growing up, you know, and I learned uh, it was quite an education, you know, to uh, work on that thing. You know, learned about sailing and all that. It was pretty good. Um, after selling Sunnyside, Dad took to uh, Port Stanford Harbor with his rowing skiff, Liberty. He had her docked at Ponus Yacht Club and would go, go out each day when the weather allowed. As a son of Stanford, he was protective and knowledgeable of the waterfront and would take reporters from the Stanford Advocate out in Liberty and talk about what he saw. Whether the cormorant and oyster population were low or the herons and swans were nesting, all of it meant something to him and he wanted others to know this was happening. And I know my, my son and uh, our, our sons are his grandchildren uh, went out on the, when he was still alive, those grandchildren that were there went out with him often. And you can see that Kay passed in 1992, at, at way, way too young, and Bucky in, in 2005. Um, whether the boat is Sunnyside, Susan, Marvel, Elaine, or Suspect, she will always remain a member of her family. There are still many stories to tell of the sails that Dad took in Long Island Sound and along the Atlantic coast. Just ask my siblings. Thank you all for taking on the challenge of putting her back in the water. We look forward to a sail sometime soon. Look, Bucky and Kay's kids. And here's a family portrait, uh, just so, shortly before I think your mother passed, the, the, uh, of the whole gang. That's the, uh, the Sunnyside crew. So, uh, it says, I would like to dedicate this section of the presentation to my family and to the memory of my mother and father and especially to my son, Matthew. We looked forward to spending summers in Connecticut and loved going out on the water with Grandpa. Now, now Beth and Tom will be available afterwards if you guys want to share any, any stories and so forth. We're going to move on to the next phase. So we knew that, uh, that Walter uh, had the boat and, and he bought it from someone named El Helen and Alfred Chase. So uh, we began to research, again, uh, Stan and, and, and Joe Chasman, when began to look into who is Alfred Chase, is there, is there a connection there somehow? And we came across uh, this letter which, um, where Chase was trying to convince the Universal Motor Company to convert a gas engine in his boat to a diesel engine. They said it can't be done. Uh, but we, from that, we were able to get his, uh, his name in, tied to an address, which we had not been able to find. So we thought, all right, let's, let's research Chase Aeronautical and see if we can find a connection there. And lo and behold, we found Chase Aviation Services in uh, Jamestown, New York, with Brian Chase as the president. And we thought, Eureka, we've made, the con we've made a connection. When we reached out to Brian, he said, no, I'm afraid not. That's, Alfred is not uh, related to me. But he said, let me take a look at the paperwork and I'll see if maybe it triggers or something. And I think earlier I mentioned, um, take a look at, at uh, oops, take a look at uh, the Helen Chase signature. 
And when he saw the Helen Chase signature, as he was reviewing the documentation, he said, you know, my grandmother was Helen Chase. Um, and, uh, but she was married to Edmund Chase. Uh, we, we just heard from him about three days ago that it looks like um, that Alfred was, um, was the first marriage. His brother uh, married his wife when he passed. So uh, Brian is, is now going through family papers to see if he can find ownership records and photographs and so forth of the boat uh, from uh, 1961 back. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mission in process. So here's, the, uh, here's the, the provenance of the boat from being found in a field in Westport, Connecticut, all the way through being found in a field in, on Cape Cod <laughs> and, and everything in between. So the question is, is she the marvel? So we know that uh, the research stops in 1921 um, in roughly Darien, Connecticut. Uh, we know from the top-down search that uh, the story an, uh, sort of picks up in Westport, Connecticut. Um, it's a 40-year gap, but the difference between Brush Island and Westport is four and a half miles, basically. <laughs> so it's possible, it's possible that it's the same boat. And you're going to see later on, I think Tom may have, uh, may have thwarted this idea, but we made a discovery during the restoration that we thought might might convince us that it is definitely the marvel. And you have to keep in mind the date, 1921. So here's some research that, um, that, that uh, Joe Chowman did. Uh, he he uh, haunts uh, the, the Thomas Crane Library in, in, uh, in uh, Quincy, Mass, and documents things from yearbooks from the Quincy Yacht Club. And here's uh, kind of his handwritten script uh, copying over one of the, the, uh, the yearbooks from the Yacht Club. And lo and behold, he came across the fact that they don't, rec they don't document the marvel as being a, a Herb Crosby boat. They say in some cases it's a Crosby boat, in some cases it's a Daniel Crosby, some cases it's a Daniel and Charles Crosby. But the only Herb Crosby boat that they list in their yearbook is a boat called the Elaine. And uh, so she may be the Elaine. And uh, we're in the process right now of trying to hunt down who JP and R Bainbridge are but if she is the Elaine, she was built in 1890. And if she is the Marvel, she, it looks like she was built in 1892. So that, that, uh, that effort continues. So is she the Marvel? Well, we suspect, we suspect she may be. Is she the Elaine? Well, we suspect she may be the Elaine. We may never know, but in advance of the relaunch after the restoration that we conducted, we thought, well, there's a big S on her sail. And since we suspect she's one of these boats, one of these two, we'll call it the suspect. And so, <laughs> and so for the time being anyway, until the documentation proves that her pedigree, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, launch her and use her as the suspect, and you won't be able to uh, miss the big S on her sail. So that's, that's where we're, we're taking it. All right, now we quickly go through the, the phase uh, of, of the renewal. Um, so in June, finally, Brownell was able to haul boats again in June of 2020. And so we, we put Brownell to work, uh, pulled the boat out of the yard. And uh, this is a, a photo taken by uh, Jim O'Connor of the boat being uh, stripped down to see how, how much work we needed to do as far as uh, her fastenings. And we discovered a lot of work. <laughs> the, uh, uh, this was a typical uh, a couple hours work of pulling fastenings out and um, you, see, you can see that uh, she needed to be refastened, which we, which we did. Uh, one of the interesting fastenings that we found, uh, we found many, many of these fastenings, many of them stamped US. And it turns out that they are minesweeper, uh, minesweeper nails or bolts. Uh, and the Luda's Yard, which we know that the, uh, some of the people that restored the boat when she was Sunnyside with Bucky worked for the Luda's Yard, and we don't know if it was a five-finger discount that created these <laughs> nails, or was it, uh, or was it a scrap, scrap because he was in the scrap business. But we know that uh, about 30% about of the fastenings that were still good in the boat were um, destroyer mine sweeper uh, fastenings. Kind of interesting. Uh, here's uh, you know, the usual uh, treatment of epoxies and things. Uh, her spars were in pretty decent shape. They, the seams were opening up 
We, again, volunteers who knew about mass uh, suggested that, um, that and, and, and actually did the restoration work using a special type of, of flexible epoxy that's used in mass building. And her spires are now uh, completely restored. Uh, remember, I, I said the date 1921. Well, while, while, while cleaning out the lower levels of the bilge um, while we were rebuilding her mass step, lo and behold, we come across a coin, a silver dollar, 1921. And we thought, aha, this may be the critical link between the boat that was left in Darien, Connecticut in 1921 and, and then ultimately being the boat that Bucky found. And um, my bubble was maybe popped earlier today by Tom, who said, no, I think my dad put that coin in there. You know, it's a, he had a 21 coin sitting around. He put it in there, I think. So we don't know. We, the, uh, we don't know, but that's a thought. But it would be an amazing coincidence if that's the case. It's a tradition. <laughs> it is a tradition. Uh, her sail is actually in remarkably good shape. We had the sail uh, sent to, a, again, a, a volunteer group that uh, restores sails. Uh, the sails were uh, cleaned and restored, as were her sail covers. Uh, these are before they, they went out. So the sail is an almost new uh, sail. It's a, day, it's a Dacron sailcloth sail. And then the engine. The engine was uh, sort of disassembled when we bought the boat. Uh, it needed a little more than paint and putty. Uh, here I am, I, I know diesel's enough to be dangerous, so here I am assembling it with my, uh, my five-year-old grandson. Um, he was, he's a very excellent diesel mechanic, I'll tell you. <laughs> he really knows his stuff. And, um, and here's the boat assembled, and we thought, all right, fingers crossed, uh, let's give it a try, a uh, first try. The darn thing ran. Okay, it, it, it did run. And, and uh, we did have, in order to make it run, we did have the starter motor and the alternator rebuilt. And again, uh, it was done mostly uh, through volunteers. Uh, we did find a pinhole in her exhaust hose, which we, uh, experts told us, oh, use rescue tape, which is this amazing stuff. If you don't know what that is, it's, uh, you should look into it. It's a, it's a flexible tape that uh, becomes a, a high temperature, um, sort of bandage, uh, a permanent bandage for things like exhaust. It's used for, apparently, for muffler, exhaust pipes and mufflers and things. So, uh, and we've tested this and it looks pretty solid. We also replaced the gauges. Uh, you see a lot of varnish work. We had a whole team of folks who did varnishing for us. They came in uh, and did the varnish work. And again, volunteers were a key to the success of this. Uh, the monies that were raised were mostly used for supplies, for insurance, and for storage. Some new cabinetry. Uh, we salvaged some teak from various parts of the boat that we didn't think needed the teak and built things like new hatches so that we could gain access to fuel tanks and different things that we didn't have access to in the past. Uh, this character, George Schuld, who's part of the, uh, I'll, I'll say that the, the, uh, the Silent Maid group, I will say, the Silent Maid group uh, said you needed to have a, a, a special racing uh, version of a pull, a, a winch to pull up the centerboard. Uh, this is what it looked like. He secured one, uh, and again, this was at, their, at the Silent Maid's cost. They secured one from England. And, um, and in addition, they had a computer design a new centerboard and uh, had it made out of space age material. And here's George delivering the, the thing. The Wow, oh, incredible. This is made out of a, a G10. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, negatively buoyant. Um, it'll be, the boat will be long gone and this centerboard will still be in existence somewhere. And, and, uh, and, uh, and again, this was done uh, courtesy of the Silent Maid Group. Um, and uh, George is their expert on Give me a thumbs up here. <laughs> centerboards and, uh, and, and winches for centerboards. Here's a video of the boat going up. Uh, the boat yard had no capacity to lift the boat uh, Fantastic. properly. And so we had to dig a six foot trench under the boat in order to install the centerboard. And she is going up into the, into the trunk. Yeah. 
There it is. Up for the first time. Fantastic. Clean it off. All right, she's Eureka, in. Eureka. Thumbs think, up, George. You're one. <laughs> Thumbs up, you're one. Thank you. Now the advantage, I think someone, and maybe here, uh, has one of these winches in their sailboat, in, in their catboat. We've seen this on, in a photograph. The, uh, the advantage of this, I'm told, is an eight to one uh, ratio of pull on the centerboard. And it had no problem getting the board up, as you can see. But the, the, the line that runs from the winch can be run to the helm. So a person at the helm can adjust the angle of attack of the centerboard which is sort of neat. That's kind of neat. And, and we played around with that once the boat was in the water, and it actually does work. It's a, it's, it's a, clever, it's a clever idea. Um, we, a lot of the bronze work uh, was, was taken off the boat, and volunteers uh, put in their elbow grease to restore the, restore the here are the, the port lights. These port lights uh, all look the same, but they're all very slightly different. And again, we think that good old Bucky was probably salvaging these things somewhere. And, um, and they were all, uh, many of them were in, in, in sort of poor condition. They were all restored, uh, new fittings put in, um, all new gaskets and so forth and so on. And this is just a, one sampling. Almost everything that was bronze on the boat uh, was taken off and restored. Uh, the inside was stripped, painted. The varnish work on the mahogany inside. The, the mahogany, the, again, remember it was a, a minesweeper is built out of teak. Most of the inside of the boat and the floorboards and the decking is teak. So we're thinking, and it's about four quarters, one, like one inch thick teak. And um, we're not sure where that came from, but we have a suspicion. You know, the, uh, uh, the electronics, this was the original electronics panel on, on the boat. And, um, and it was replaced with that small electronics panel. And again, uh, two volunteers who are experts, and that's their, their business is, is installing marine wiring and, and large yachts, came by and rewired the entire boat and put all the, all the electronics in. The electronics itself, the advanced radios, the uh, both handheld and fixed, and uh, the depth sounder and GPS were all donated by the Silent Maid Group. Here's uh, some of the wiring. And yes, that's knob and tube wiring. The boat still had some of its original knob and tube wiring, which was, uh, which was in vogue back in the early 1900s. And decks were refastened and all kinds of things like that. New bilge pumps put in. Uh, remember I said that the, the, uh, the, the bilges plate had been stolen. And I think it was Bob Jones that lent us Patience uh, a, a bilges plate from his Herb Crosby boat. And um, you can see that old photograph of where the plate used to be. And um, a local founder in, uh, in Westport, Mass, volunteered his services to create uh, new copies of, of that. And uh, we've given one to Bob, I think, for his, for his Herb Crosby boat. And, um, and we've donated one to the uh, museum, the, Her the Crosby Museum in, in Osterville. But uh, it was a, it's a sort of a perfect reproduction so here's the boat as we came into this spring. It was, this is an April photograph. And she's basically looking pretty good. She was, at that point, what we considered just fully restored. The, uh, her spars were restored, the boat was restored, engine running, ready to go. And uh, so we invited some, some celebrities. These are the, uh, that's Andy Crosby and his wife. Um, his great, great grandfather built this boat, it was Herb Crosby. So if this is a Herb Crosby boat, that is his great-great-grandfather's boat. And then you see Beth and Tom, um, who you've just seen. And uh, they were all pretty pleased at the progress we had made on the boat. So the launch and relaunch. Here's the boat, the, uh, the first of three uh, launches that we, we conducted over the course of the summer.
was going to say, notice that no bilge pumps have come on. Um, <laughs> and here she is. However, however, uh, we brought her over to, uh, again, another donated dock site, the Slates in Westport, and, and discovered that she was actually leaking. She was leaking 60 gallons an hour. Right. And uh, so we had pumps going, uh, even salvage pumps going, like nonstop. And we thought, well, maybe she'll tighten up. But she, did. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> and as Bob will attest, we, uh, we, thought, we thought it was her drift pins. We pulled her and, re and, and, it, and epoxy injected the drift pins. It wasn't the drift pins. We thought it was this. We, we pulled it. It wasn't that. Until finally, um, oops, I'll go forward. Um, here's, well, actually, here's a video of the, of the leak. It's a good one. Uh, so we enlisted again. Bob generously donated his capable talents, uh, pulled uh, the, the port garbage plank, which we thought where the leak was uh, coming from, and lo and behold, discovered that um, her stop waters had been improperly placed in some restoration in the past. And I don't know if you want to make a comment on that, but it's, uh, it was, uh, there, there, he's pointing to, you can hardly see them, but there were two stop waters in the wrong place, under the plank. Few years, yeah. but not not here. Anyway, uh, Bob um, built a new plank, recocked the boat, um, put it all back together. We filled the boat with water, and she's tight. So that was good. But we noted we had also noticed that when the boat was in the water, and uh, the engine would start, but as soon as you'd put the engine into gear, it would stall. And we discovered, to our surprise, that. After, and again, an engine expert was called in that the number one cylinder, the number one injector was not firing, uh, not firing at all. The engine was actually running on one cylinder. And as soon as we put it into gear uh, in the water, because um, it ran perfectly well out of the water, the, the, uh, the, the friction from the propeller in the water stalled the engine. And uh, we tried desperately to get that injector out. That injector should have come out as easily as a spark plug comes out of a lawnmower but we discovered that uh, both injectors were fused into the block. And uh, we tried, we had all kinds of experts come and try to get that bloody injector out, and no, no luck. So we finally decided, let's pull the head. We did, here's the head off. And um, in trying to get the injectors out in a motor rebuilding shop, they actually pulled out the injector along with its, um, its, its coupling, its water coupling. and effectively destroyed the head. <laughs> so, so we put out on, on eBay, anybody have an MD7A Volvo head? And lo and behold, Sweden had one. And, uh, and, uh, and this is the, it, it, it matter, from ordering it to delivery was seven days in Sweden. It was all wrapped in like cosmoline and um, it, with, with, they claimed new injectors and it had been machined flat and it all looked very good. We had an expert look at it, and they said, gee. But just for safety's sake, we took the injectors out, and they came out just like pulling a radish out of wet ground, brought them over to Associated Diesel in Dorchester, Mass., who is an expert on, on these types of diesels. And here's, um, here's the proprietor uh, testing the injectors. And I don't know if you've ever seen an injector fire, so this will show you what an injector looks like when it fires. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back it up. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> and we ended up having two good ones, but it, I, have, I had no idea that the injector fires 
in a, in a pattern that looks like a big X. That, that's what's going on inside your diesel engine, by the way. <laughs> so just thought you'd find that entertaining. <laughs> so here's the boat where she sits. So she's uh, ready to go back in the water. Uh, we're hoping to launch her uh, in April, and maybe end of April, weather permitting, and, um, and enjoy the season that we hope to have had this year with, uh, with the boat. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, as many of you know, many of you contributed, uh, we set up a Go Get funding page. We created a nonprofit organization, uh, Historic Restoration Marble Project, um, which has now evolved into the Catboat Preservation Group. And if you look on your table, you will see little cards which uh, allow you to link to the website and do other kinds of things like make donations. And uh, so the, the mission is, again, our goal is uh, the, the boat is owned by the Catpo Preservation Group, and the idea is that we want people like folks in this room to have a sail in this boat, to sail in this boat, because it's really a remarkable experience. Uh, you'll see uh, bandits around. The little card on the side is what you'll find on the table. Uh, also, I think Skip had mentioned that, um, that we're going to have a new column in the uh, Catpo Associates Bulletin, the Save This Cat, very, very much like what's in Wooden Boat Magazine where we will list two or three cat boats that are worthy of saving. They're, they may require paint and putty, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> but, are, but if you're interested, or you know of anybody who's interested, uh, it's a boat that's worth save, saving. And, and, we're, and Ben DeLong, who's here somewhere, has been researching these, and he's amazing at hunting down these boats that are on the, on the cusp of being savable or not. Um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to post uh, uh, a schedule that aligns with the rendezvous schedule in the Cat Boat Association. So if you go on to the website, you, you, you link in, you'll see as the boat makes her way from these various sites um, where the boat will be. And our goal is to have the boat uh, there early, a few days before the rendezvous and a few days after the rendezvous. So anybody who wants to sail on the boat, either before the race or during the race, uh, all you have to do is sign up. Sign up and do it. There'll be no charge. Uh, donors will be given uh, pre preference, but th we're not really charging for this. We want to have, we want to put butts in boats, <laughs> and and uh, that's that's the idea. So uh, so just keep an eye on. The, log into the website, take a look, and um, and we hope to see you on the boat. So this is sort of the finish. The uh, again, uh, this is the grayling. Um, is uh, also, we think, going to make your way down from Maine and will join the fleet. Uh, Doug Goldhirsch, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, has suggested that uh, he would like to have uh, patrons on the boat. And, um, and hopefully uh, Marvel, Elaine, whoever, suspect, will be, uh, will be afloat this season. We would encourage you, again, if you can, to make a donation. If everybody that owned a boat in this room donated $5, that pays for the insurance for the year. If everybody in this room that owned a boat paid $25, that's, that's, the, that's this season's expenses. So I would encourage you, if, you like, if you'd like to see this boat in the water in action and you'd like to have the opportunity to cruise on the boat or to sail on the boat, um, please consider a donation. And with that, I'll, I'll say adieu. Thank you. Thank you.